so this is part of our iWest seminar series, and you can see the information about iWest uh, on the screen here. I think the main thing I wanna draw your attention to is that what we're trying to do is to understand how to get the Intermountain West region to carbon neutral through uh, development of new energy economies. And obviously these need to last for decades. So understanding how this region will look over the coming decades is an important part of that. And we're looking forward to having uh, Ruby tell us a little bit about that. Next slide, please. Uh, the the iWest effort's a place-based effort, which means we're we're uh, really focused on trying to understand the region and understand opportunities, needs, and perspectives from stakeholders within the region. We've had a number of different uh, outreach events as part of this. Most recently, we've been focused on topical workshops. You see those over on the left side that are looking at specific technologies that have emerged as being important in the region. Um, you, you see we have a couple that are coming up, so if you're interested in those, just please uh, feel free to drop an email to uh, iwestatlanta.gov, and we can make sure that you're kept apprised of these as they come forward. We also have a series of seminars that we've been hosting to try to understand issues about the region. These are also archived um, on our website, and you see the resources tab that's mentioned there at the bottom. So if you're interested in listening to one of the seminars that's already happened, or getting information about workshops that have already happened, uh, the iwest.org website is a great resource for that. I'm just going to uh, remind folks to be sure to put yourself on mute um, so that we minimize uh, background noise while Ruby's talking. Next slide, please. So we're really pleased and excited to have Dr. Ruby Lung here to talk to us about um, climate in this region. And as I mentioned at the beginning, Understanding how the climate is going to evolve uh, is really important for us to, to in, in the context of getting a roadmap for energy transition, thinking about what the energy needs will be in the context of that. How does climate impact things like water availability, uh, fire uh, danger, things that we need to consider in the context of energy transition. And uh, Ruby's in a, an excellent place to tell us the latest on this. She's the chief scientist for DOE's uh, e 3SM, which is the Energy Exascale Earth System Model. And you can see she's got a, a great background. Um, there are a number of, of fellowships that, uh, that she's been awarded, including she's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Uh, she got her BS in statistics from the Chinese University of Hong Kong and an MS and PhD in atmospheric sciences from Texas A&M. So uh, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome you very much, Ruby. Thank you again for, for being here. And we're looking very uh, much forward to hearing about projecting regional climate change and its impacts in the Western US. Thank you very much for having me. So I'm going to start sharing screen, but at the same time, I'm going to stop sharing video. I, I will turn it back on when we have time for discussion. Um, okay, so I'll start sharing now. Okay, so are you able to see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. All right. Okay, first of all, um, again, thank you for the um, invitation and the opportunity to uh, to present about our work. Um, so I'm going to talk about projecting regional climate change and its impacts in the Western United States. But actually this talk, I'm going to touch on three uh, topics that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, the first topic um, is based on a paper that we just published earlier this uh, week, actually on Monday, um, I'm going to particularly talk about global warming um, can increase extreme weather events. Um, I, I'd like to quote a very interesting statement from the American uh, from the American Meteorological Society in their bulletin published back in 2017, and we, they said that we are experiencing new weather because we have made a new climate, and I'm going to explain that I. What this statement, what this statement means, and 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 where this is coming from, 
and then I will uh, talk about regional climate change in the Western United States. Uh, most of our work actually ha um, have been focusing on uh, the coastal region of the Western United States, uh, including California and the Pacific Northwest. So I'm going to use California as an example, although I do understand that this group has a particular interest in the Intermountain West, and I hope that um, uh, not too long in the future, we will put in uh, more efforts into into looking in, uh, at the in the mountain west as well. So in this part of my talk, I'm going to focus a bit more on understanding the robust and non-robust changes projected by models. <coughs> by robust, I mean when we look at many different climate models, sometimes they might project similar changes in the future, but also quite often they would project very different changes in the future. So that's what I mean by robust and non-robust. We want to understand why they are doing that. And then lastly, I'm going to introduce the DOE Youth 3 sm uh, project, including our strategies and the progress in advancing Earth system modeling for actionable science. <coughs> Excuse me. So with this, I'm going to start my first topic, which is on global warming, increasing extreme weather events. So this figure here shows um, a UN report that was published back in 2020, and they look at the uh, natural hazards um, comparing two time period between um, an earlier period of 1918 to 1999, and then a later period between 20, uh, 2000 and 2019. And you can see on the left hand side, uh, there have been significant increase in many different types of disaster especially noticeable is um, changes increase in the flood and also increase in the storms but we can also see increase in drought and other activities such as wildfires and these have been really causing significant um, impacts on human society in terms of increasing the depth the deaths and also affecting people and also um, economic losses right um, so we know that these extreme weather events um, are affecting people in many different ways, but particularly of interest, I think, to this group would be the impacts of extreme weather events on the U.S. energy sector. So I'm just going to show like three uh, noticeable examples here. So back in June of 2012, uh, there was a derecho that passed through uh, West Virginia, causing power transmission infrastructure damages exceeding $170 million. And then back in 2017, the Hurricane Harvey in Texas caused power outages affected more than a quarter million customers. And then only more recently in June of last year, there was a heat wave in the U.S. Pacific Northwest, and you can see this is Seattle. Uh, there was rolling blackouts amid heavy power demand. So we have been seeing a lot of these extreme weather events, and so the question is why extreme weather events are expected to increase with global warming. Uh, we often think about global warming as just warming by a few degree, right? So if we are talking, if we are using Celsius, we're talking about just maybe a warming of one to three degrees Celsius globally. Uh, regionally, this increase in the temperature might be a little bit higher, but still it's just a few degree. So often we would think that how can a, a, an increase in just a few degree can cause significant change in the extreme weather events. So this really goes back to the fact that in order to produce extreme weather events, it's all about energy, right? So does the Earth system uh, have enough energy to really support extreme weather events? And so this then go back to the fact that Energy is not just about the temperature, right? So the temperature is what we call sensible heat because we can feel the temperature very easily. But a large part of the energy in the Earth system is not just the sensible heat or the temperature, but rather the humidity. So this is what we call the latent heat. And it's important to notice that there is a very nonlinear relationship between temperature and humidity. So as the temperature rises, humidity can increase almost exponentially, nonlinearly in increasing. So this increase in the humidity with temperature following this relationship, what we call clausius clapeyron relationship, is really important for three facts. Number one, because humidity or water vapor in the atmosphere 
itself is a greenhouse gas. So as the, the temperature gets warmer under global warming, so this humidity, increase in the humidity itself, will act as a greenhouse gas and further increase the temperature. And so we know that by acting as a greenhouse gas, humidity can amplify the warmings by a factor of 1.5 to 2. So that's very important. But secondly, as humidity increases with warming, so does the latent energy release, right? So, so for example, when you have convection going on uh, due to um, some heat energy near the surface, then the, uh, the water vapor will condense and release the latent heating. And that latent heating itself is very important in driving convection and also atmospheric circulation. So in a sense, the increase in the latent heating, which we often don't feel, we, we feel the temperature, but we don't feel the, the humidity as much, but that latent energy actually plays a really major role in increasing uh, weather extreme, especially for the fact that it increases with temperature in a very nonlinear way. So in this paper that we just published earlier this week, um, we really advocate for looking at global warming, not necessarily in terms of surface air temperature, which is what we have always been looking at. Uh, global warming is like warming by one degree Celsius or two degrees Celsius. We refer to the increase in the surface air temperature. What we advocate is that we need to use a quantity such as surface equivalent potential temperature. We call it theta E and it's an integrated metric of both temperature and humidity, which is important because then it tells you the total amount of energy that is actually available to support uh, changes, for example, in extreme weather event. So with that, I'd like to show you what's the difference in terms of uh, the temperature, in, uh, the, the increase in the surface air temperature versus the increase in the theta E, which is also in the unit of degree Celsius. So if we compare that in the past as well as in the future projected by climate models, <clears throat> You can see typically climate models project that the global uh, surface air temperature increased by perhaps a few degrees Celsius, like up to like three degrees Celsius. But if we are talking about this theta E, which include not only temperature, but also humidity, it can increase towards the end of the century by as much as like 12 degrees Celsius. So this is a really significantly higher increase in the energy that can fuel changes in extreme weather events. So when you look at, uh, for example, the spatial distribution of how theta E might change in the future, you can see a lot of the changes are much higher over the tropical area, and which, which is reasonable because the tropics is where the temperature would be highest, and that's also where the humidity would be highest, right? So if you compare the tropical area versus the Arctic area, you can see when you're in the tropics, you feel a lot of moisture. Uh, but then there's also this larger warming over the Arctic area, and that's because of this polar amplification uh, due to a surface albedo uh, feedback effect. So, so with that, we well, it's really important to to note that first of all, this is much more nonlinear increase in this theta year temperature, and the magnitude is much higher compared to looking at just surface air temperature itself. So, why is then uh, uh, looking at this theta year important? So, we I'm going to show just one example by uh, showing you the correlation between surface air temperature with a quantity called convective available potential energy. So this is essentially the amount of energy that is needed to create convection. And convection is what we know often induce extreme precipitation or extreme weather events. So uh, on the left hand side, you see this correlation between surface air temperature with uh, this CAPE, convective available potential energy. And you see particularly over land, there's actually a negative correlation between the two. On the other hand, if we look at the correlation between theta E and the same quantity CAPE, you can see actually they are highly correlated, not only over the ocean, but even over land, suggesting that uh, indeed this theta E quantity is a much better quantity to look at if we are interested in CAPE or extreme weather events that are driven by convection. So, um, 
then we are also often interested in extreme precipitation, right? So here we compare annual maximum precipitation. You can consider that as extreme precipitation average over the tropical area. And here we are showing the vertical axis is the annual extreme precipitation and the X axis is the surface air temperature. You see a pretty poor correlation uh, with the coefficient of only 0.33. But on the other hand, if you correlate this annual maximum precipitation with theta E, you can see a much higher correlation of 0.98. Again, suggesting that this theta E quantity is a much better metric to use if we are interested in extreme events such as extreme precipitation. So now it's important to note that I already show this uh, annual mean evolution of uh, the uh, theta E temperature versus the surface air temperature. And here I'm showing the spatial distribution of what we have seen historically in the last uh, 40 years or so. And you can see both historically as well as in the future. If we look at theta E, the increase has been much higher than compared to only looking at the surface air temperature. And I've already shown you that weather extremes are more strongly correlated with theta E. What we found in this study is that in the future, towards the end of the century, when theta E increased by about 12 degrees Celsius, this will contribute to a 14 to 30 fold increase in the frequency of heat extremes, a 40% increase in the energy available for tropical dip convection, as well as an up to 60% increase in extreme precipitation. So, so by that, I mean, Theta E is an important quantity to look at related to extreme weather event. But again, showing here that this um, increasing rate of the theta E is much more exponential or nonlinear compared to the almost linear rate of increase in the surface air temperature, suggesting that there is a much faster rate of increase in the weather extremes compared to the almost quasi linear surface air temperature warming. So, what it means is that if we only look at setting warming targets based on surface air temperature, it would have very different implications compared to what if we set temp warming targets based on theta E to limit the changes in weather extremes and what would the policy implications be. So with that, I close my first part of the presentation and I'm going to the second part, which is to show some particular examples of regional climate change in the Western United States using California as an example. So, uh, in my previous few slides, I already uh, discussed uh, a lot about this theta E um, increase in the future, right? So, we can see rather uniform spatially increase in the theta E, but if we look at increase in the extreme precipitation in the future, we see larger spatial variability. Um, and this is partly because uh, the increase in the moisture has to interact with the atmospheric circulation in order to produce extreme precipitation. And, and therefore, it suggests that it's really important to look at regional changes and not only global averages. So this is why we have to start looking at, for example, regional changes in the United States or the Western United States. So in this presentation, I want to particularly highlight the fact that seasonality is a really key aspect of regional climate change that we need to pay attention to. So this figure here <clears throat> shows the timing of the maximum monthly precipitation across the United States. And you can see a big difference when we come go across the United States. Like for example, in the Western United States, in areas such as the Pacific Northwest and California, precipitation pretty much peaks during winter time between January and February. But moving across the country in the central United States, precipitation kind of peaks around summertime or during the warm season. And this seasonality is important, for example, in the Western United States, where a lot of the precipitation falls during the winter time between November to March. And then that could can cause accumulation of the snowpack in the mountain between February and April 
uh, peaking around that time. And then ultimately, the snowpack will melt and then create a stream flow in the river, peaking between April to June. And then towards the end of the summer, when there is not a lot of precipitation, as well as not a lot of stream flow in the river. So this is when we often experience drought and wildfires between July and October. So understanding the seasonality, of the precipitation and how the seasonality might change in the future is really something that I want to emphasize. So this is uh, based on some studies that we published in the last few years, looking particularly at precipitation in California. And as I mentioned, uh, precipitation in California peaks in the winter time between December to February. What we found is that under global warming, comparing the blue curve and the red curve, which we show more clearly in the bottom over here in terms of the change, we see a sharpening of the precipitation seasonal cycle in that during the peak precipitation season in the winter, we see that under in the future precipitation will increase, but on the shorter season um, in uh, fall season as well as the spring season, climate models project that there will be reduction in the precipitation in the future. So essentially we see more increase in the precipitation during the peak winter season, but then drying in the spring as well as in the fall. And these are showing many, many different climate models using what we call a sharpening wet season index, comparing the change in the precipitation during winter time uh, minus the, the change in the spring and the fall season, comparing the ratio between the future and the historical period. What we find is that most models project that this ratio will be larger than one, meaning that there would be sharpening of the wet season in the future. So in order to understand why so many models are telling us that the precipitation seasonal cycle will become narrower or sharpened, uh, we can take a look at, first of all, why winter precipitations are projected to increase. So we, what we see in the climate models is that there are two particular reasons for the increase in the wintertime precipitation. Number one, uh, in the wintertime, a lot of these uh, storms are being steered towards uh, California. And and in the future, we see that climate models project that the uh, the jet stream that steer the storm tracks towards California will actually increase eastward so that it would steer even more storms towards California during winter time. At the same time, the climate models are also showing that there would be this illusion low pressure system over the North Pacific Ocean. And this low pressure system are going to direct the winds blowing from the Pacific Ocean towards California and again increasing the precipitation during winter time. So this is the part related to the winter precipitation. But what about the spring and the fall season? Why should we be seeing a reduction in precipitation during those seasons? So for that, we have to take a look again back to this very nonlinear relationship between humidity and temperature that I talked about before. So in uh, Western United States, we know that most of our winds in the winter time comes from these westerly winds blowing from the Pacific Ocean towards California, right? So we need to understand, is the wind blowing moister air from the ocean <clears throat> towards land in the future or the other way around? In order to understand this, we need to notice that in the winter season, typically the land is colder than the ocean because the ocean, uh, the, heat, uh, the heat capacity is very high. So even in the winter time, the ocean can be very warm compared to the land. But in the future, under global warming, we expect the land to warm up more than the ocean. And that's also because of heat capacity, right? So the land has much lower heat capacity. Therefore, it can warm up much faster than the ocean. So at the end, what it, what we need to understand is how the humidity over land versus over the ocean will compare in the future. So take a look at the winter time when the land temperature is much colder than the ocean. So land temperature is way down here. In the future, even though the land warms up more than the ocean, which doesn't warm up as much, but because the temperature is down here in this nonlinear curve, so the increase in the humidity Overland is not as high as the increase in the humidity over the ocean. And therefore, the westerly winds are blowing 
more humid air from the ocean towards land in the winter season. And so the and so the precipitation will increase. But when you start looking at spring versus and, and also the four season, the land will already warm up, even though it is not as still quite a bit colder than the ocean. But the land already moved towards this nonlinear part of the curve. And under global warming, with the much larger warming over land compared to the ocean, the increase in the humidity over land is going to <clears throat> dominate over the increase in the humidity over the ocean. Therefore, the westerly winds are blowing relatively drier air from the ocean towards land, and therefore making the hum uh, making the precipitation during spring and fall to be reduced um, under global warming. Um, but the changes in the winter season, the increase in the precipitation is actually rather highly uncertain as we started looking at different climate models, right? Since this is also shown when I show you before this ratio of the sharpening precipitation seasonal cycle, even though most of the models show a ratio above one, but these values are actually vary quite a lot. And this is mostly because the winter precipitation increase models kind of project all over the place. Some models project very large increase in the winter precipitation and some models project like a very small or even a reduction in the precipitation. So to really understand why the, there is such a large uncertainty in the model's projection of the future wintertime precipitation, we begin to look at many, many climate model simulations. Uh, some of these simulations are produced by many different climate models, so we can see whether the uncertainty is because these models are very different from one another. Or we also look at some uh, simulations, what we call large ensemble simulations. So these large ensemble simulations are produced by a single model, but perturbing the initial condition so that we can see all the different possibility of how it looks like in the past or in the future. Um, not related to the model uncertainty, but related to the internal variability of the climate system itself. So combining a total of 318 simulations, produced by different climate models or produced by the same climate models, but with different initial condition, looking at the internal variability, then we can look at the uncertainty in projecting the future. And what we see is that indeed, these models show large uncertainty in projecting precipitation or simulating past uh, changes in the precipitation during winter time. But what's important is that we find that a lot of these uncertainty, in fact, almost like 80% of the uncertainty is related to internal variability rather than uncertainty related to running different climate models, suggesting that these type of uncertainty related to internal variability might be very difficult to reduce in the future. So what do we mean by internal variability? So essentially, uh, we know that the ocean, like for example, the Pacific Ocean, um, often it, there is a multi-decadal oscillation called interdecadal Pacific Oscillation, uh, shown by these um, sea surface temperature pattern, colder in the North Pacific and warmer in the Equatorial Pacific. So this pattern of sea surface temperature can induce uh, changes in the atmospheric circulation to change the precipitation in California in a multi-decadal time scale. So for example, if we look at this in the decadal Pacific oxidation uh, in the past many, many years, we see that in the last 40 years, this IPO has been in a, in a negative phase and, and therefore is actually causing a drying over California simply because of this natural variability at the Cato time scale. It, it is because of this actually that contributed to a lot of um, the drying in California that we have seen in the last few decades. So no wonder why climate model is not able to simulate the drying in California is because this is actually part of the natural variability. So when we look at the climate model simulation of precipitation changes over California, and if we account for the fact that in the last 40 years, this IPO has been uh, in a negative phase, then we can actually correct for the 
climate model simulations and show that actually the models are able to simulate a drying over California if we do account for this negative phase of the IPO. But in the future, then it would be very difficult because we have no way of predicting far out into the future, let's say between 2020 to 2060 or between 2060 to 2099. We have no way of predicting whether the IPO is going to be in a positive or in a negative phase. And therefore, the uncertainty in projecting uh, the the changes in the wintertime precipitation in California will remain very high because of this internal variability of the system itself. So uh, what might be the implications of this sharpening of precipitation seasonal cycle? I want to talk about this particularly related to wildfires, but let's first of all take a look at whether this sharpening of the precipitation seasonal cycle has or can already be found in the historical record. What I showed you previously were climate model projecting into the future. So there is a study that actually looked at the precipitation over California in the past uh, 40, 60 years, and they already found that in the past record, uh, precipitation, wintertime precipitation in California has an increasing trend, whereas the precipitation during fall and spring season has a re uh, reducing trend, therefore suggesting that this actually support the model projection of this sharpening of se uh, precipitation seasonal cycle in the future. So you might think now that, well, if the spring and the fall season are going to be drier, even though the winter is going to be wetter, uh, what about the wildfires, right? So we know that wildfires happen mostly during summertime and, and also the fire season usually lasts through uh, the fall season. So here we take a look at the observed uh, wildfires, particularly related to both um, the uh, spatial coverage of the burn area, as well as looking at the emissions coming from uh, wildfires. So here we looked at four different clusters of wildfires that we found um, over the Western United States. Uh, so the blue curve here shows the um, mean or the average um, over like roughly uh, 40 years. Uh, and then you see that in these four clusters of um, the wildfires, uh, the peak of the wildfire season usually is during the summertime. And the orange bars over here shows the changes that we see comparing the last 10 years to the previous 10 years. And we see interestingly that there has been increase in the wildfires coverage as well as the emissions coming from wildfire, but this increase has been mostly concentrated over the four season. So for example, if you look at cluster one, the increase is mostly concentrated in September. Similarly, the increase in cluster two is concentrated in August and September. So this is really consistent with the fact that there has been a drying in the uh, during the fall season, and this is causing the wildfire season to extend towards uh, the e towards the end of the summer season and causing more uh, wildfires due to the drying, uh, in, uh, decreasing the fuel moisture in autumn compared to summertime. So, so, so at, um, this is really uh, suggesting that we need to pay attention to these changes in the seasonality of precipitation in the future. So now with that, I'm going to just quickly go over the last part of my presentation on strategies and progress in the DOE Energy Exascale Earth System Model E3SM project, particularly trying to address some of these um, uncertainties, right? Um, if, if we need to provide information, regional climate information, as well as providing uncertainty information so that the information would be useful, what we call actionable science, meaning that we, we desire to be able to provide climate change projections that are useful by the stakeholders. So how are we going to do that? So here I want to emphasize that the E3SM project involves uh, over 100 scientists working across eight different national labs, and we also have some university collaborators. So the E3SM project particularly focuses on addressing uh, DOE's energy mission, uh, recognizing that climate change can have a lot of implications for the U.S. energy sector, 
uh, very early on in my presentation, I already highlighted some examples of uh, extreme weather events uh, that can have large impacts on the energy sector. And since climate models project a lot of changes related to those extreme events, we need to pay attention to how under global warming, for example, how water cycle may change and therefore affect uh, water availability and extreme storms in the future. We also need to understand how global warming may be affecting biogeochemistry and therefore, uh, which is very much perturbed by how human is using energy. Um, so this en um, the energy sector decisions is part of this uh, science driver. And then also a lot of interest in understanding how global warming will be affecting sea level rise, which is related to cryosphere systems. So these are the three main science drivers that the Youth Resident Project is focusing on. So in terms of achieving our actionable science goals, we have three different strategies. The first one is to go towards high resolution modeling so that we can better simulate extreme weather events and predict how they might change in the future. And secondly, we need our model to represent not only natural processes, but also managed and man-made systems because these kind of interactions between the natural systems and the managed and man-made systems are what we need in order to provide scenarios of the future of how we might perturb the system and how the, how the earth system may respond and therefore constrain the way that we can manage and use resources. And then lastly, we also need to provide ensemble simulation, similar to what I showed before in the California example, where we need to provide ensemble simulation to capture the uncertainty. So this project is very much a collaboration between earth system scientists and also computational scientists. So related to our first strategy of high resolution modeling, so the youth resm project, we aim to be able to run our models on DOE's uh, computers. And so exascale computers are going to become available later this year. And so we have several different model configurations all the way from low resolution to very high resolution. So currently we pay a lot of attention to these storm resolving simulation where we go down to three kilometer in the atmosphere and go down to six to 18, 18 kilometer in the ocean. So these kind of resolution will allow us to better resolve weather systems and also mesoscale eddies in the ocean. Uh, but these kind of simulations are very, very expensive. So in order to achieve that, even though our models is uh, our model, we can run globally at this kind of high resolution, but we do have capability where we use what we call regional refinement, which I'm going to show you a, a little bit later. By going into this type of regional refined meshes where we put high resolution only in places where we need them, we would be able to have a computationally efficient way of getting to high resolution, but still be able to run large ensemble simulations to capture uncertainty. So first of all, let's, let me show you why resolution is important. So this is just one example showing uh, comparing simulation with observation at low resolution versus high resolution. So here high resolution refer to about 25 kilometer and low resolution refer to roughly 100 kilometer. You can see that even by just going from 100 kilometer in the atmosphere to 25 kilometer, we are already much better able to capture the observed variability of precipitation over the Western United States. Similarly, by going to 25 kilometer resolution, the model is able to much better Similarly, tropical cyclones and hurricanes comparable to the observation uh, much better than with the low resolution model where we barely capture some of these um, hurricanes and definitely not able to simulate the really intense category five type of hurricanes. So with that, uh, we need high resolution. But in order to get to high resolution and still be able to do many, many simulations with computational efficiency, our model has a pretty unique capability where we can develop these regional refined meshes where we can put high resolution in areas where we really need them. In this particular case, for example, we really wanted to have high resolution over North America so that we can better look at regional climate change across uh, the United States. And so this is one particular regional refined mesh that we have currently been using a lot. 
And another regional refined match might be to put high resolution over Antarctica, where we really wanted to better simulate the ice sheet over Antarctica corresponding to the ice sheet instability that could cause significant increase in the sea level rise in the future. So with that, we can also take a look at our current capability to be able to simulate globally at three kilometer resolution. So this is a particular version of our model uh, that we can run at three kilometer globally. And we find that at this kind of resolution, the model is able to um, do a really good job in capturing, for example, a, a very typical kind of phenomenon called atmospheric rivers that dump a lot of precipitation in the Western United States, affecting not only coastal California or, or the Pacific Northwest, it's actually also affecting the Intermountain West quite a bit. So with this type of capability and also the ability to run this type of model on GPU enabled exascale computer, we are really looking forward to better using such capability combined with regional refinement to get down to very high resolution to be able to simulate extreme storms. And secondly, I also already mentioned that a, a pretty unique capability of U3SM is the capability to represent not only natural processes, but also human systems. So there are different aspects of the model in terms of representing human systems. For example, at pretty high resolution, our model is able to capture these human activities like land use, land cover change, the river, irrigation and water management so that we can address questions related to, for example, bioenergy production and the impacts on water scarcity. And our model is also coupled with this global change analysis model called GCAM, which allow us to really exchange information between the natural systems with the human systems, including like the economy, uh, the energy system, and the land use land cover, as well as water system. So this type of capability is critical for developing meaningful scenarios for us to evaluate, for example, carbon neutrality, uh, how we can achieve carbon neutrality using different options of um, energy production and use, and how that might affect the Earth system. And as a result, changes in the Earth system might constrain the way that we are able to achieve carbon neutrality. So with that, I'm going to summarize uh, my presentation since I presented three different parts. So I'm going to summarize uh, all three parts. In the first part, I talk about the importance of accounting for humidity increases and the fact that humidity increases non-linearly with temperature. So the energy associated with this humidity is what is really driving the significant change in the extreme weather events. And so we demonstrated that extreme weather events correlate much more strongly with this quantity called theta E, which combined temperature with humidity than with just surface air temperature. And then as theta E increases much faster than surface temperature, so do extreme weather events. And this is why we are seeing extreme weather events have changing much more than just the mean condition. And so this would have implications for warming targets to limit changes in extreme weather events in the future. In the second part, I talk about the importance of looking at seasonality changes. In California, in particular, models show uh, sharpening of precipitation seasonal cycle, but even observation in the last 40 years already show this sharpening of the seasonal cycle of precipitation. The robust Spring and fall drying is well understood because it's based on simple physics of the clausius clapeyron relationship, but there is large uncertainty in projecting future changes in the winter precipitation, and that's largely due to internal variability, including the interdecadal Pacific oxidation. Unfortunately, that type of uncertainty is irreducible because there is no way we can predict towards the end of the century, whether the IPO will be in a positive or a negative phase. Uh, this sharpening of the precipitation seasonal cycle has lots of implications for wildfires, and I already show some evidence based on observation. And clearly, I think this uh, sharpening of the precipitation seasonal cycle will also have implications for heat extremes and drought as well. 
And then lastly, I talk about E3SM. Our goal is to use E3SM to support actionable science by going towards high resolution, by representing both human and earth system interactions, by running our model computationally efficiently so that we can create large ensembles of simulation to capture uncertainty. We focus on three science drivers looking at changes in water availability in storms, changes in heat waves and wildfires, changes in sea level and coastal inundation. And lastly, I want to emphasize that E3SM represent collaborations between Earth and computational scientists. We optimize our model to run on DOE's computers, GPU enabled modeling for exascale computer and in the in the near future and actually already happening, we emphasize a lot on the use of AI machine learning to improve model accuracy and performance. So with that, I'm going to end my presentation and stop sharing screen and see if there are any questions for me. All right. Well, thank you, Ruby. That was extremely informative talk. My name is Rajesh Pawar. I'm the technical lead for the iOS project. Um, so uh, the session is open now for questions. Uh, if you, uh, for the audience, if you want to ask questions, either raise your hands or submit them through the chat. And I already see there's one question from Stephanie. Um, so her question is on the sharpening of the seasonality uh, in California. Does this finding extend to regions where maximum precipitation is not in winter? That is the Intermountain West precipitation peak in summer or fall. Yeah, this is a very important and interesting question. Um, first of all, well, because I show, remember, I show a map of the peak uh, month when precipitation happened in different parts of the United States. In the Western US, uh, a lot of places we have precipitation mostly happening in the winter time, whereas other places the precipitation actually happened more during warm season. Uh, we find that in California, this uh, the seasonality change is expressed by the sharpening of the precipitation seasonal cycle, right? increase in the peak winter season, but then reduction during the fall and spring. We find that in other regions, it's not necessarily the same kind of changes. For example, over the central United States or the Midwestern United States, we also find changes in the seasonality of precipitation. But in that region, the changes are such that the early part of or the or the or the early part of the summer season will experience increasing um, precipitation or floods, whereas the later part of the summer season will experience more drought. So these um, changes in the seasonality we need we, we need to look at region by region because of the particular type of features happening in different region. Right, so different regions have different peak season of precipitation and the processes that are responsible for producing precipitation are also different. So I think it would also be interesting to look at the Intermountain West as well, which we have not uh, paid that much attention to so far. Okay. I mean, from a you know fire threat point of view, you know, Intermountain West is kind of feeling similar, uh, uh, you know, threats like California um, mm -hmm. as well. And so it will be interesting to see uh, given those differences in seasonality and when they occur in California with respect to or compared to California in Intermountain mm -hmm. West, it will be interesting right. to see if you see similar kind of effects when you take that into account. So uh, the next question, uh, how can biogeochemistry information at the micro scale be incorporated into the models? Um, micro scale <laughs> might be a bit challenging to incorporate micro scale, but in Earth system model, uh, as you know, we cannot go to very high resolution, but we do use uh, parameterizations to help us represent processes that the models are not able to explicitly resolve. Right, so, so we do try to incorporate understanding into parameterizations that um, so currently some of these parameterizations that we use in uh, earth system model do um, 
try to represent some of these microbial processes uh, or, or things like that, but certainly lots of rooms for improvement in terms of how we represent biogeochemical processes. And they are important because when we look at further out in the future, the biogeochemistry feedback is the one that would really be controlling a lot of the changes in terms of the temperature, right? So, so, so the, the carbon cycle feedback is important for the temperature, which then is also important for the humidity part that I talk about because the humidity increases non-linearly with temperature. So, yeah, I, I, I appreciate this question and, and, and the fact that uh, improving modeling of biogeochemical processes is really important. All right, so I had a question as well. Uh, in, the, in the projections that you had, uh, in the in the beginning part of your uh, talk, um, you had the polar amplification uh, shown, and I noticed that it was uneven in the sense that Arctic uh, uh, was projected to be more affected compared to Antarctic. Um, mm -hmm. Now, not being a meteorologist or not being familiar with that, can you uh, explain as to why there is that? You know, why is the um, polar amplification more pronounced in Arctic compared to Antarctica. Yeah, so so this is partly related to the fact that Arctic is basically an ocean, right? So there are sea ice over the Arctic, whereas the Antarctica is basically covered by land with the with the ice sheet. The temperature is really really cold, much colder in the Antarctic compared to the Arctic. So under global warming, uh, the Antarctic will be will continue to be really really cold. So we don't we do not expect the ice sheet to be totally melted and the global warming in the Antarctic, but in the Arctic, because it's uh, ocean uh, uh, and covered by sea, sea ice, we expect that warming can significantly reduce the coverage of the sea ice, and the sea ice itself is reflecting sunlight. So by reducing the sunlight, uh, uh, reducing the sea ice coverage, that would, re that would inc uh, reduce the surface albedo reflecting the sunlight back to the atmosphere. So this is a positive feedback that can help significantly increase the warming over the polar uh, po over the Arctic region. Okay, yet, um, so I'm just trying to reconcile. You said the, in terms of the refined models that you have, you're still focusing more. I thought you said uh, there is, in, of course, one version you mentioned about uh, uh, re refining uh, mm. uh, in Antarctica. And right. I think in that context, you mentioned uh, also from the point of view of trying to see uh you know the mel melting right. of ice over there right yeah so 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 particularly the interest in antarctica is related to the ice sheet and ice shelf instability so so even though we do not expect the ice sheet to be totally melted under global warming in the, in antarctica but the but but the ice sheet itself can gradually move towards the ocean forming this what we call ice shelf and then the and then with the ocean beneath the ice shelf uh, there is an instability called ice shelf instability. So this ice shelf can easily break off and, mm -hmm. and then it can significantly contribute towards sea level rise. So, so the emphasis on Antarctica is more related to sea level rise, whereas the emphasis over the Arctic would be much more about sea ice melting. Right. Okay. So we actually also have a regional refined mesh where we put high resolution over the over the Arctic as well, because this is also very much of interest and important to DOE because uh, the melting of the sea ice and opening of the Arctic uh, for transportation, all of these are important issues to be addressed. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So next question is, what is the process and cost to run models for the Intermountain West region of the US? Uh, um, uh, can you repeat the question again? So I believe um, the question is about if now you you know you you talked about some of the mod models uh, or simulations you did for California focus around you know California. So the mm -hmm. question is more in terms of if you were to do the same in the context mm -hmm. of the Intermountain West region, I, what are the computational costs and what you know what I is the typical computational process so to speak? I, Walter, I hope I'm 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 capturing your question accurately. Okay, yeah, so, um, well, first of all, if we are to use the Y3SM model, the Y3SM model is a global model. Uh, we, uh, in terms of 
the regional refined mesh, our interest would be to have a regional refined mesh covering all of North America because this, this is overall an important region. So we won't be only doing very high resolution over the Intermountain West. So we, it would be high resolution across the whole uh, United States or North America. Um, some studies have been done using regional model where they only put a high resolution, smaller region uh, uh, domain over a particular region. Even for those type of simulations, most of the time, I think the high resolution region would be covering the whole Western United States. So if there is an interest in looking at some of these sim high resolution simulations that include the Intermountain West, there are these uh, simulations available. So, um, but in terms of computational resources, definitely the higher resolution you go, the, the more computational resources you need. So this goes with uh, kind of like the third power. The, by doubling the resolution, you actually increase the computational resources by a factor of eight because of the increase in the number of grid points as well as you have you have to use smaller time step. Yeah, so 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 which is why we are really keen on using this regional refined mesh so that we don't have to do high resolution globally, yeah. which is really very expensive. Yeah. Right. Okay, so the next question, along with predicting changes in seasonal precipitation cycles and intensity, does your model suggest anything about increases or decreases in net annual precipitation for California and the Intermountain West? Um, yes. Uh, so, so besides, uh, well, I emphasize the seasonality change because I, I, I think that seasonality change is important because it, it affects like the melting of the snow and then the, and then the stream flow, etc. Um, there are also a lot of studies that simply look at the annual mean changes, right? So, but unfortunately, the annual mean changes are oftentimes very uncertain. And that's because, you know, imagine you have for California, as an example, right, you have an increase in the wintertime precipitation, but you also have a reduction in the precipitation during spring and fall. So as a result, adding up together, you, the annual mean changes are usually rather small, and that could be misleading because then people think, oh, well, the change in the pre annual precipitation is only this much, right? But it is the change in the seasonal part which is important because it is the change in the wintertime precipitation that accumulate as snowpack, which then provides you with the water available in the summertime, right? So, so I really wanted to, to emphasize that, but yeah, but, but many studies have looked at annual mean changes as well. Okay, the next question is, could you say a bit more about the implications of using surface temperature and humidity instead of surface air temperature for decarbonization plants? Yeah, so mainly um, I want to emphasize that um, it, it, mainly in the context of extreme weather events, right? Because we, we all worry a lot about extreme weather events. Um, and in that context, the energy needed to create extreme weather event, a big part of that energy comes from the humidity part, not from the dry air temperature part, right? So so what we what we are showing is that if you do include humidity in the context, then that quantity called theta E shows that in towards the end of the century, I mean it can be an increase up to like 12 degree compared to if you only look at the surface and air temperature that would be only just about three to four degrees. So this is a huge difference. And so when so if we do have to consider how much we need to limit CO2 emissions in order to prevent the earth going into a state where we would experience a lot more increase or changes in the extreme weather event than that warming target. What should this warming target be? Right? So we often uh, talk about the warming target. It's like, oh, um, how, what can we do to keep global mean temperature change to within two degrees Celsius? So this is often what we have been discussing, and that is based on just the dry air temperature itself. So keeping two degree uh, warming means that actually it's already a lot of increase in the extreme weather events. So is that enough, right? So I, I think in that context, um, there's a lot of implication in terms of how much we need to do uh, in terms of um, decarbonization. What's the target? We should be we should be shooting for. 
Right. So you what you're suggesting could be more aggressive compared to, you know, the uh, potentially more aggressive compared to what is being yeah. recommended now. Yeah. Yeah, for the for the fact that this uh, theta E increase is much larger, as well as for the fact that the rate of increase is much faster, right? So we might think, oh, we have plenty of time because you now temperature increase almost like linearly, so we have we have lots of time. But if you look at theta E change, the rate is so much faster, so so it's also a matter of timing as well. Okay, well, I don't see any additional questions, and we are on the dot. So I want to thank you again, Ruby. It was an excellent talk and do appreciate your time. Uh, and uh, hopefully we'll be seeing some more results from you in, in the context of Intermountain West as well. So thank all you. Right, thank and you. thanks all for participating. As uh, was mentioned, this recording of this talk will be available on the iWest website and also um, uh, do uh, visit it in terms of the upcoming seminars. All right, thank you. Okay. Thank you.